The main goal of today's video is to examine the closest family members to the set of complex numbers. But in order to unpack what that sentence even means, we need to look at a pretty precise definition. And then after we look at that definitions, we'll look at some other examples of objects that satisfy that definition before we jump into our main goal. So let's look at our definition. So an associative R algebra, where that's the real numbers, A is a vector space over R with a product. So that's a way of multiplying two vectors and getting a new vector. And that product must satisfy four axioms. So for all U, V, and W, we have an associativity axiom. So U times VW is the same thing as UV times W. We do not have a commutativity axiom. This is an associative algebra, not an associative commutative algebra. Then we've got a distributive rule here and here, depending on left distribution or right distribution. So that's gonna be A V plus W equals UV plus UW or u plus vw is the same thing as uw plus vw. And then finally, we've got a method for scalar multiplication, which remember that exists here because we have a vector space. So the interaction of scalar multiplication and this product in our vector space. So a times uv is the same thing as au times v, which is the same thing as u times av. So this might look like commutativity, but it is not. Because this A is a scalar, it's not a vector. It just says that this scalar can be moved to any portion of the product. Furthermore, A is called unital if it has a multiplicative identity, which we will generally call one. Let's look at some examples. So I've got four examples worked up here. Although, as we move forward, we'll really just look at the family that is around its this last example. So our first example is pretty classic, and that is the space of all two by two matrices. This could really be the space of all n by n matrices. So this is most definitely a vector space. It's a four dimensional vector space, in general an n squared dimensional vector space. And then of course, we've got a method for multiplying matrices. And that method of multiplying matrices satisfies all of these rules over here. Um, furthermore, matrix multiplication is not commutative. So this would be an example of a non-commutative associative algebra over R. Another nice example is the polynomial algebra. So I'll say that this is R adjoin X. So that's going to be all polynomials with coefficients in R in indeterminate X. So we could write that as A0 plus A1X all the way up to ANXN. And this is going to be for n bigger than or equal to zero. So if n is equal to zero, we get constants. And then those ai are real numbers. So our next example, which is like pretty interesting, is called the quaternions. And that's going to be all linear combinations of the number one and then these imaginary numbers i, j, and k. So in other words, it's of the form a plus b, i plus c, j plus d, k. a, b, c, and d are in reals. So this is another four dimensional vector space, just like this one up here is. But here we've got a rule for the multiplication of the i, j, and the k. So they all square to negative one. So i squared is the same thing as j squared, which is the same thing as k squared, which is negative one. And then we've got this other multiplication rule over here. So i times j is k, j times k is i, and take k times i is j. And if you do any of these products in the opposite direction, you pick up a minus sign. So j times i is minus k, k times j is minus i, and i times k is minus j. This might seem a little mysterious, but you can remember it by making this like nice triangle of i, j, and k. And if you follow the triangle with the arrows, you pick up a plus sign. And if you go against the arrows, you get a minus sign. So i times j is equal to k, whereas j times k is j times i is negative k because we went against the arrows. Okay, and then obviously c is like a subalgebra of this where the c and the d component are equal to zero. But importantly, c is a two-dimensional unital algebra over r. And so when I say we want to look at C, the complex numbers, and its family members today, what I mean is we're going to classify all two-dimensional 
unital algebras over R. Okay, so let's get to that. So we'll start off by supposing that A is a two-dimensional unital algebra over R. So what I mean by over R is it's going to be just a two-dimensional vector space over R. So our set of scalars comes from the field R. But if it's two-dimensional, that means it has a basis of two elements. So let's take the basis, I'll call it B, to be equal to the number one. And by one, I really mean the unit element. And then one other element from that, which is I'll call alpha. So in other words, everything in A can be written of the form X plus Y alpha. So that's the shape of an arbitrary element within A. Okay, nice. But given that's the shape of an arbitrary element from A, it kind of makes sense to ask, what does it look like if we take alpha and multiply it by itself? Well, that's gonna give us something in A, but since it gives us something in A, it will be of this form. So let's maybe summarize that as follows. So let's note that alpha squared will be in A. So that tells us there exist, I'll call them A and B, which are real numbers, such that alpha squared is equal to A plus B times alpha. So something like that. But look, this looks like a quadratic equation in alpha. So since this is a quadratic equation in alpha, that really leads us to do something like complete the square. So let's do that. So we can start by doing alpha squared minus B alpha equals A. So something like that. And then from there, maybe we can multiply both sides of this by four. That will give us four alpha squared minus four times B alpha equals four A. And then we'll add something to both sides of this equation so that we complete the square on the right hand side. So over here, maybe we will add just a B squared. That means we need to add a b squared over here as well. But now we can factor out that left hand side and that left hand side factors like 2 alpha minus b quantity squared. And then the right hand side looks like 4a plus b squared. Importantly, this 4a plus b squared is a real number. Okay, so that looks good, but this gives us some motivation for making a new basis. So let's notice if our original basis was one and alpha, then we can also have a basis, which I'll call B prime of one and this thing two alpha minus B. Really we read this as two alpha minus B times one, so it's in the span of this. But I'll name two alpha minus B equal to beta. So let's write that here. So where, let's see, two alpha minus B equals beta, and importantly, beta squared is a real number. So up here, we had alpha squared to something that was a linear combination of our two basis elements. But here we have beta squared after our change of basis, squares to something that's a real number, which is a little bit easier to deal with. Okay, great. So let's maybe bring this fact to the top and then we'll keep going. So where are we so far? We've got a two-dimensional unital algebra over R. On the last board, we showed that we were able to take a basis of two vectors, one and beta, where beta squared to a real number. And now we're gonna break this into cases. So the first case that we'll look at, so I'll call this case one, is what happens if beta squares to zero. So in this case, you get something called the dual numbers, which I have another video about. Let's maybe change our notation a little bit so it's in line with that video. We'll set beta equal to epsilon, and notice that we have epsilon squared equals zero, and that means that our A is in fact equal to this R adjoined epsilon, which which is how we denoted the dual numbers as before. And let's just recall if we have A plus B epsilon times C plus D epsilon, we get A C plus, let's see what we'll have, A D plus B C times epsilon. 
Importantly, when we have B epsilon times D epsilon, that goes to zero, which is why we only have A, C for the real component there. Another thing that we should maybe notice is that this does not allow every element to be invertible. That means it's not a field. And we can immediately see that because it has so-called zero divisors. In fact, this number epsilon is a zero divisor. So now let's move on to case number two and just kind of motivating what we did with case number one, if beta squared equals zero, case number two will be what happens if beta squared is less than zero. So in other words, beta squares to a negative number. And here we're going to be motivated by complex numbers. So let's recall in the complex numbers, I squares to negative one. So let's take that inspiration and we'll set I equal to beta over, let's see, the absolute value of beta squared. We need to do the absolute value of beta squared because beta squared is less than zero, so beta squared is negative. Okay, but under this setup, we see that i squared is equal to negative one. So that means all of the cases where this beta squares to a negative number are equivalent to the case when we have this additional component that squares to negative one, in other words, the complex numbers. So here we have our algebra A is equal to, like I said, the complex numbers C. And maybe we could just do a product here as well. So A plus B I times C plus D I will be equal to A C minus B D, just because I squared is negative one. And then we'll have A D plus B C times I. And it's very well known that the complex numbers form a field. Everything is invertible. So now let's look at our third case, which you can probably guess what our third case is now. Since we looked at the case when beta squares to zero, when beta squares to a negative number, now we'll look at when beta squares to a positive number. But here we'll do the same kind of thing that we did above. We'll like normalize that and we'll set J in this case equal to beta over beta squared. And let's notice here we get J squared equals one. So that means our additional vector squares to the unit. So up in this first case, our additional vector squared to zero. Here it's squared to negative one. Here it squares to positive one. And in this case, you get something known as the split complex numbers. So you could write this as R, maybe a join J if you wanted to. Another thing that's maybe worth noting, and I won't work this out here, but under a sufficient change of basis, this is the same thing as the algebra given by just R cross R, and the multiplication is done component-wise. So anyway, if we have A plus B times J here, and then C plus D times J here, well, that multiplies out pretty easily to AC plus BD, AD plus BC times J. Now, this second guy here, the complex numbers, was a field, it didn't have zero divisors. This first case, the dual numbers, was not a field, it had zero divisors, epsilon squared to zero. Well, in this third case, the split complex numbers also has zero divisors. And we can give that as an example. Maybe if we have one plus j times one minus j, so that difference of squares will give us one minus j squared, but since j squared is one, we get one minus one, which is equal to zero. So that means things like one plus j are not invertible, which means this thing is not a field. Okay, so look, we've classified all two-dimensional unital algebras over R, and I would say that this is maybe the closest algebraic objects that are in the family of the complex numbers because the complex numbers is one of these two dimensional unital algebras over R. So maybe the last thing that I would like to do is to look at some graphs of well-known objects like circles, for instance, in each of these setups. So here I wanna look at the notion of a circle in each of these three two dimensional real unital algebras. So first we'll look at the complex numbers. So maybe in each case we'll look at the unit circle. So this is kind of easy to talk about over here, and this will give us some motivation for how to talk about it in these other cases. So 
what we want to do is look at all z in the complex numbers such that the modulus of z is equal to 1. So like I said, that'll be the unit circle. But now if z equals x plus i y, by the definition of the modulus being 1, we get x squared plus y squared equals 1. This x squared plus y squared is in fact the modulus squared, but I think that's okay here. So that means that all z that satisfy this rule have their real and imaginary components satisfying this rule. But that gives us the well-known like unit circle. So let's maybe make a picture of this. So this would be all such z values would live on this unit circle of points that are one unit from the origin. So this is our real axis, and up here, this is our imaginary axis in this complex plane. Okay, so now let's look over here in R adjoined J. So let's take a z here and see what it takes for the modulus of z to equal 1. Well, let's see that that means the same thing as the modulus of z squared equals 1, which is the same thing as x plus jy times x minus jy equals 1. If we want to be motivated by the same definition of modulus as over here. But let's see. That's going to, in the end, give us x squared minus y squared equals 1 if we multiply all that out. And that's, of course, because j squared equals 1. Okay, but that's, in fact, a hyperbola. So notice that it will cross the x-axis at 1, 0, but it will never cross the y-axis. So it gives us a hyperbola that looks something like this. So here we've got a circle in the complex plane. This is a so-called circle in the split complex plane, which looks like a standard hyperbola. Now let's see what we get over here. So let's take a z over here, where the modulus of z equals 1, and use this same motivation. So we've got the modulus of z squared equals 1, which tells us that x plus epsilon y times x minus epsilon y must equal 1. Okay, so now multiplying that out, we'll see that tells us that x squared equals 1. Because the y part goes away, that's because epsilon times epsilon is 0. But if x squared equals 1, that tells us that x equals plus minus 1. So in the end, we get this kind of collection of two vertical lines. So we get a vertical line there and we get a vertical line there. So this would be a vertical line at one and a vertical line at minus one. So just to reiterate what we've seen, we get a normal circle in the complex plane. A hyperbola is the version of a circle in this split complex plane. Finally, these two parallel lines is an example of a circle in the dual number plane. Okay, that's a good place to stop.